Hey, hey, welcome to the weekly huddle with Shibs, where I bring you weekly Bitcoin adoption news and interviews from experts in the space. Every once in a while, I do an interview that gets me pumped up because of a new perspective for Bitcoin in a hopeful world. This week, Aladdin from Bitcoin Trading Cards had me listening as intently as one of your little kids watching an episode of Bluey as he described his journey to educating the general public by creating the first collectible Bitcoin trading cards. Uh, also describing his future ideas of how to expand education and he even likens the current developments on Bitcoin to a fictional fantasy story that we're living in as we continue to create a better world for our children. I'm truly excited to share this episode with you and I even do a pack unwrapping with Aladdin's commentary included with it. Please do not forget to like, share, and subscribe to the channel as this fun episode and Aladdin's voice deserves to be heard. Leave a comment about your thoughts uh, and future topics uh, and guests that you'd like to see, and I'd be happy to accommodate those. But let's dive into it. Aladdin, welcome to the Weekly Hoddle. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure, man. Uh, I was excited to to meet you at the Bitcoin conference. Uh, your booth was absolutely packed with people, but I managed to introduce myself and we got to exchange cards, uh, and that's why you're here now. Yeah, I'm glad you did. No, it was uh, definitely a, a wild couple days, and um, it went really, it went quick. Let's just say that. Yeah, I, so. You know, I, this was my second Bitcoin conference, and last year the, I felt like, you know, the Bitcoin bazaar they call it, where all the little uh, Bitcoin shops kind of are, were just, you know, they were there. People were kind of meandering through them. I don't really see anybody like engaging like very aggressively. Uh, and this year, like at a conference that had half as many people. You couldn't even walk through the Bitcoin Bazaar. It was like, you know, the open source stage was packed and then the big everybody left there and went to the Bitcoin Bazaar to buy their, you know, their little Bitcoin hodlers, their Bitcoin trading cards, uh, their their freaking Bitcoin panties, you know, panties for Bitcoin and, and all this yes. stuff. <laughs> yeah, this, this 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 stuff is really caught on, right? The the collector and every Bitcoin uh, person ha has kind of caught on, and it seems like uh, you guys really exploded this year. What was your experience like? Uh, it, it was amazing. Um, the, one of the biggest things that we do with the trading cards is we collaborate with as many people in Bitcoin as possible, especially the plebs. So um, there was a lot of people in the pack that were in the bazaar. So you could come to the booth and check out, get a pack, open it up. And then you look behind you and you're like, oh, shit, there's Mir One and I have his card and there's Asano and I have his card. And you could just go through the list of all the different people that were in the pack that were right there in the bazaar. And then it it worked both ways. You'd go to Austin O's booth, and then he would have a couple cards out with with his card on there. And then they're like, "Oh my God, where'd you get that trading card? How did you do that?" And then he'd point down the row. So we're working with a lot more uh, Bitcoin companies to continue this, and that's going to be one of our biggest pushes is collaboration across the board. And I think that's a lot of what made this year so fun because. Not that there was major competition between other Bitcoin companies before, but this I think this really just opened the door of how amazing it can it can be with all of us working together and how much more fun it is when there's this this amazing synergy between each of these Bitcoin companies as you walk down the line. And it definitely was the, the fun place to be in Miami, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, it was a blast. So let's let's back up a little bit uh, and, and let's just talk about what you do, who you are, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Excellent. Um, where to start? Um, <laughs> been in Bitcoin since 2016. Um, I, I feel like I was born for Bitcoin. Um, red pilled at a very, very young age by my dad. Grew up with a hippie family, so never believed in taxes, never trusted the government. Um, all those things were ingrained into me before I ever reached junior high. So finding Bitcoin in 2016, all lights flashed and I knew 
with within about a week of podcast and I was already going down the the even deeper red pill rabbit hole hardcore around that time I mean 2016 all the craziness that happened with the elections and wildness and the world was going woke and all kinds of excitement happening so um, I was already digging really deep and then that's where I found Bitcoin through a buddy of mine and we just started digging together really hard and it was aha moment um, hardcore so dug in really deep quit my uh, business that I had going at the time, which was actually another trading card project that I was working on, uh, moved my family out of the area that I was in and basically with no job at the time. And I'm going, whatever I do, I'm going to figure out a way to do it in Bitcoin. And right around 2017, I started the idea of Bitcoin trading cards and played around with a bunch of different ideas, drove that through 2018 bear market um 2019 came around and i said the biggest thing like it's find a need fill a need and, and what is the biggest need we, we need to figure out how to talk to normies about bitcoin and not scare the shit out of them so that was where the trading cards took so many different changes as my original thought to where they came and i started going out and um doing consulting for the general public when it came to Bitcoin, teaching classes and just talking to the general public about Bitcoin nonstop everywhere I went, really to soak in as much information as I could from them. What did they like about Bitcoin? What was scary about Bitcoin? And create um, a breakdown of how I would make these cards so that I could give someone a pack and give them little tidbits of Bitcoin, the things that they were really excited about. And when we launched in November of last year at Pacific Bitcoin, me and my partner, after four, almost four and a half years of working on this project, we were like, okay, well, let's hope that we can sell the first series within a year. <laughs> and uh, it, it definitely was the complete opposite of that. It took off incredibly quick. And then it was, okay, now now what do we do? Because we were not imagining uh, <laughs> quite the the run that we had. So that that's the the launch into uh, where we are today, basically. Yeah. How quick did that first series go? Two months. <laughs> All right. Uh, you, you you're like so so. How do we even? We need to we need to start reaching out to new Bitcoiners. <laughs> well, yeah, and we need to rethink and, and how this artists. is going to work because yeah. it was supposed to be an orange pill in a pack, and these Bitcoiners don't want to let go of their pack. So. That was our biggest leg. Oh, shit. Now what do we do? Like, we weren't expecting them to keep them necessarily. We were expecting them to give them to friends and family and like orange pill people outside of Bitcoin, but they don't want to let go of their cards. So that's not going to happen. So then that was the real rethink of now what do we do? So then we kicked out the second series, uh, doubled the amount of packs for the orange pill in a pack, which is our flagship series. And we've been out for about two weeks maybe two and a half weeks and we're almost completely sold out we're at like 95 percent sold out so again um i don't think any of these packs are going to reach the the general public oh. yeah so so i will tell you uh i've got a fud buster pack here that i want to open with you a, a little bit later but originally i bought this for my nephew and i got home and i was like uh by the way sorry joey if you ever watch this in the future um <laughs> but i got home and i was like Marissa to my wife I'm like I got Joey a pack uh, of Bitcoin cards like you know kind of rare collectible Bitcoin cards and she was just like you know he's just gonna like destroy and lose those right and I was like oh <laughs> she's like oh you know maybe just buy him some Bitcoin that'll be better <laughs> that'll be better for him in the future <laughs> that, that'll last longer in his hands and I was like Okay, that's that's what I'll do. So I'm excited to be the owner of these again uh, in, in my own head. Uh, but to your point, uh, yeah, like it's it's hard to part with something. You know, we we all appreciate scarcity and the idea of uh, a scarce, valuable good. And so the idea of trading cards, I think, kind of aligns pretty well with kind of like you know a general understanding that most Bitcoiners have. You know? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple elements to what is making them so collectible in the Bitcoin space. I think one of the biggest ones is like trading cards. You don't get much more nostalgic than that. Been around 150 years, collected with your parents, your grandparents. 
Um, a lot of memories and history um, with everybody for the most part in trading cards. It can be even just recently with uh, my kids and Pokemon and trading cards just have a special place in many people's hearts. Um, I, I went through the Pogs epidemic um, in the 90s. Uh, <laughs> Pogs were really big at, at, at one time, but they didn't last long. And no. I don't think many people have Pogs left where trading cards is that collectible that lasted through the decade and even longer. So one of the one of the things is the nostalgia of it, but I think something really special that sparked with this is the fact that we're literally changing history right now in a way that's never been done since the beginning of humankind. There, there's never been a decentralized money. There's never been a hope quite like we have with Bitcoin right now. So everything that's in the pack is like freezing time in these cards. And I think a lot of Bitcoiners are looking at it in that way. They're like, it, when 2022 was when FTX shit on the world and uh, Terra Luna and all the ridiculous crap happened across the board, that which was basically some of the best advertising you could ever do for Bitcoin, at least people that were in the space. And those memories need to be locked in somehow. So having certain cards that highlight that for that particular year, you can look back 10 years from now and hold those cards and go, oh my God, do you remember that? Yeah, my cousin had a Bitcoin on FTX and lost it all. And there's a <laughs> lot of uh, nostalgic memories, not all good, but many memories people are going to look back on in 2022 and then 2023 and so on and so forth. And locking in these moments in time with the artwork, with the descriptions, with just the foil wrappers, it's that feeling that you get the nostalgic feeling of trading cards, but really like locking it in this moment in time. And yeah. I think that's one of the special things that we've captured with these. That's so cool. So how do you, how do you go about uh, selecting your topics for the new cards and how does like uh, the art, like the artwork. And, and again, I haven't really like opened these ones yet, um, but everybody raves about the artwork on this stuff. So like, how does that process work? You know, how does like the actual creativity portion work? So I'd say the artwork is the funnest part for me. Um, I've been an artist my entire life. So I spent a, a lot of the four years was on the art and it gave me an excuse um, with the family and the kids to say, hey, I'm uh, I'm busy doing work as I'm <laughs> sketching out these cards, which was a lot of fun. Um, so the sadly, artwork is yours. Yeah. So I, I, f I finally had to get to the point where I had to take my sketches and I couldn't finish everything on the computer. I just, with everything I have going on with this project, I don't have the yeah. time. So it was really cool as I started reaching out to different artists that I would find on Instagram and Facebook and different uh, social medias where I would just like hashtag certain uh, styles that I really was into. And then I would find the artist and I'd reach out and talk to him about Bitcoin, talk to him about a little bit of red pill, a little bit of a, do you believe in communism? And if they came back with the right answers, then uh, we'd start our conversation. So at this point, I consider myself the architect because almost all of the artwork you see in there is conceptual. And to get someone that's not a Bitcoiner to come up with the concepts for these cards, um, even the economic cards, there's freedom cards, um, different categories in there that are not just Bitcoin. Um, it's not something that I want to leave on the shoulders of an artist that doesn't fully understand these. So I try to find artists that have some kind of a connection to it, but then I sketch the concept out and I find the artist whose style best matches what I'm dreaming for this sketch to become. And then I get it over to the artist and we start going back and forth on our design process. And I originally started with around 35 different artists and now I've narrowed it down to about 25 different artists. Wow. And that's a hell of a job. So the, the architect yeah. in me is um, also a, a taskmaster at the same time because keeping everyone going and, and making sure it's coming out to the way it needs to be is a lot of work. But at the same time, it's really fun. I've met some amazing artists from around the world and um, that that is the most enjoyable part. Now, the next part that is I I'd say is enjoyable in a way, but at the same time incredibly frustrating. And this is where I finally brought in my business partner was coming up with the descriptions for these cards. Like where I really got stumped was uh, the Federal Reserve when I had to do that card. I was literally stuck on it for like two weeks, and I almost quit at that moment. I was almost like just done after 
trying because I've, I've got to describe the Federal Reserve in under 60 words. <laughs> like nearly impossible. And that was one of the biggest stretches I could ever imagine. So after weeks of writing it out in so many different ways, and then I, I get it, but I got to do more research because what if I'm missing something and and Safedine and Breed Love and all these guys are going to read these cards and my description will never be <laughs> good enough for these guys. <laughs> so that was a really hard one. And that's where I brought my partner in and he's like, he works full time. I'm like, dude, you do, you have to just like find some time to just be my, my think man, someone that I could yeah. run these descriptions by the artwork, whatever I can and get your feedback. He's a highly intelligent, wonderful person. So thank God he came in because I don't know if we'd be where we are today without him giving me the feedback and he's highly intelligent. So having him be able to add to those descriptions uh, helps dramatically, but choosing the cards same incredibly hard. We've got hundreds and hundreds. I've got whiteboard whiteboards around my office with like hundreds of card ideas all over them. And how do you choose which one deserves to go in the next series before the other one? And that's a difficult one. I mean, to a point we have to Rochambeau because they're all <laughs> equally uh, worthy of being in the next pack, but uh, that's definitely a difficult one. I, I do Wait, find Ro Ro that Rochambeau, one. that's not rock, paper, scissors. Rochambeau is a little bit, uh, isn't the, the one where you kick, kick each other? <laughs> We did a lot of that. So I guess in the, maybe we threw some rocks at each other at the same time because we both had a different idea of what card should be in there. So I, thought, I, I thought, think that well, works. What's the, what's the one where guys where, where you basically like, I thought that Rochambeau was where you kick each other in the nuts. Like the person who loses gets kicked in the nuts. Never played Excuse that game. No. <laughs> oh, yeah, me neither. I thought it was Rochambeau. I'm like, oh god, I hope you guys aren't beating each other up like that over the. <laughs> no, I thought I thought bit. Rochambeau is like the original name for rock paper scissors. I could uh, you, be. You I could, could be wrong. right. Uh, I, maybe I, I've got maybe I got something else mixed in my head. I'm sure there'll be people that are watching this podcast and they can put it in the comments. Um, we're both these guys completely off, and they should kick each other in the nuts afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> exactly man but dude th th this is a, a, a super cool project like um i i think i just had lisa huff on who, who we talked about before um and i asked her because she's she's in one of your guys's new series and she couldn't be any more excited and said that she loved her conversations uh, and your approach when you reached out to her to talk about it um and you know one one of the questions i guess uh that I that I have for you is now that now that you've seen the way that this has kind of evolved, um, what impact uh, or, or how can you still make your original impact that you were trying to make um, now that you've seen like the type of people are actually holding the cards? Like, is there a way to still make the impact that you'd like to make, or how do you kind of get back to that? So we we've. All I do is this project. I work on this full time um, more than I probably should. And uh, my wife and kids want to kill me a lot of the time because um, I bring it home and, and then talk to them about it and uh, try to get their feedback constantly. Um, so, yeah, we're we're a few steps ahead on that. Um, we have two different things we're coming out with. The first one is called a pop box, P.O.P. So that is a proper orange pill in a box. And that's going to be like a deck of playing cards, right? So you get 52 cards in a pack and it'll come in a box so you can put the cards back in there, pull them out, go back and forth with them. But they won't be collectible. They will be larger. They'll be more like a tarot size. So the artwork will be larger. Um, the design will be different. And the back of the card will have a lot larger text. So it'll be easier to read. Um, very similar to flashcards in that way. Durable, something that if they get wet or moist or they're in a humid environment, they're, they're going to be just fine. Um, these are going to come out hopefully within the next month. And they're going to come out incredibly cheap. Um, we're also going to be doing a Tom's Shoes thing with this, where for every box that someone buys, we're going to be able to donate two boxes to a charity, to a, uh, maybe a sporting event that we're going to be doing to the kids and give away um, a large, large portion of these will be given away. We have friends in Africa that we're working with. Um, they wanted the packs for the kids around there. We were going to donate a bunch of packs. And he was like, that's great. But at the same time, if you donate packs, they're only going to get 10 cards in a pack. They're only going to get so much education out of that. 
that's this was months ago where we came up with this idea and that's where i said well then it needs to be durable it needs to be 52 cards at least it's not going to be by series it'll be by level so level one will be bitcoin basics economic basics in there oh my god I and then level this. two will step it up with a little bit uh, more difficult it will have our own difficulty adjustment basically with these <laughs> uh, cards as we move forward and then we can do these in different languages because we're able to get the print costs down dramatically without the foil cards, without the wrappers. Um, I've done almost a hundred hours of research into the printing and shipping and everything it's going to take to pull this off to make sure I can pull it off as affordable as possible to where we can almost give these away to the people that are going to purchase them. And at the same time, be able to hopefully give away um we're, we're we're going as hardcore as we can so i don't want to say too much right now but we've got some big things up our sleeve to be able to make these in different languages and start kicking them out all over the world wow that that's incredible i i, I love that idea and everything you said like uh as i was thinking through it while you were talking about it like was what i was going to ask you next you know like <laughs> You know, like, are these going to be cheaper than these cards? You know, cheaper than the trading cards? Are they not going to be rare? Like, how how do you get it into? So, uh, I love I love that you guys are are not necessarily pivoting, but adding, um, you know, to uh, to what you're able to offer to kind of bridge that gap and again, kind of hit that target audience that you're looking to, as well as some audiences, uh, you know, in Africa and, and things like that. Absolutely, that, that's super killer. So uh, one question that I want to ask you is, you know, commonly in our um, in, a, in our group of, of people and the, the people we hang out with, there's a there's a saying that says Bitcoin fixes this. It's a common expression. Uh, what problem? What's the largest problem that you see uh, that fires you up to talk about Bitcoin all the time that you think that Bitcoin fixes? Propaganda. That probably the biggest problem, and it's been the biggest problem since uh, the printing press and before the printing press. Um, I mean, if you go all the way back to the the time of the Bible, um, people weren't even allowed to have their own copy of the Bible. They had to go to church, and then the church would basically give them their description of the Bible, and the people were not able to have their own copies so that they could decipher it for themselves. So propaganda has been around since the, the beginning of time, and that's how the i don't i won't call them elites because they are not elite people that's how the, the the big evil is able to control the masses is with constant propaganda and fear tactics so that's what fires me up the most because um we homeschool our kids and we deal have got them out of public school as soon as i possibly could as the propaganda from 2016 and everything started just multiplying dramatically um, we haven't had TV in our house other than to watch a movie or something, but there's no actual cable of any kind. I haven't watched the news in probably four to five years unless we're on vacation and it's on in the hotel room. Um, that the propaganda is at everything. It's all the like, if you if I catch a commercial here and there, I'm just blown away at how much propaganda in commercials. It's across the board. And does Bitcoin fix propaganda? No, but Bitcoin gives us hope. It gives us something to look forward to and the fact that there is a chance for things to get fixed. And like you said, it's fix the money, fix the world. If you can fix the money, then you can fix the world. They're, by fixing the money, the, the, the big corporations that are funding all this propaganda will not have endless um, fingers on, on the, the money printer. They will not have that access directly to the money printer because with Bitcoin, there is no longer a money printer. So it'll definitely start capping these big corporations and capping their ability to outfund um, everyone else that's trying to put out correct content. So I think that's probably one of my biggest ones. It would be really nice to see people start to maybe get some... Um, correct information from what they're watching to, uh, to think that people are going to step away from their phones, their social media, their television. No, people are, they're, they're animals of comfort. 
we all want comfort. That's what makes us feel good and make us comfortable. And these devices, these screens have made us very comfortable. I mean, me and you couldn't be doing what we're doing right now without them. And it's an amazing means. Anything can be used for good or evil. Right now we're using it for good. Uh, The bummer is the majority of people, uh, not people, but the majority of companies use it for evil. And then that trickles down upon the people that are completely brainwashed by 90, 95% of what they find on these screens. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a great point. Um, I, I, I've never really thought uh, necessarily uh, about that particular point. Um, but it definitely, um, you know, taking following, uh, w- when you watch the news, following the incentives, right? Like, that's one thing that Bitcoin has taught me is to understand the incentives uh, and, and to follow them. And then also like, look for the money, right? Like, there's a lot of stuff that if you follow the trail of money, it makes you understand why certain viewpoints are being shared the way that they're being shared. Um, but to the average individual, we don't have to, like, you know, we don't have time to follow the money and do this stuff. Right. Uh, Absolutely. So we just, we just consume. Um, but one thing that Bitcoin does teach us is don't trust verify. Right. Like, Absolutely. That's one of those things. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're even slaves to it to the point, and this is probably why one of the big reasons I see these cards being so successful, and I, and I thought of that in the beginning when I was uh, consulting with a lot of um, general public, is when you start getting into Bitcoin, when you are in Bitcoin, I am in Bitcoin, anybody is in Bitcoin, we are mainly in Bitcoin because of all the bad news. And we're in Bitcoin for hope. We're in Bitcoin because it can fix things and we want that fix. But like the conference, for example, um, when you go and you listen to the speakers on the stage, there's not a whole lot they can say other than a couple like good talking points about something good that's coming up. But the majority of it is the world's screwed. The monetary system's screwed. We're getting ready for the biggest depression we've ever went in. Housing market's crap. Everything's crap. And there's not a whole lot to look forward to other than Bitcoin. So it's great to see them and listen. But after myself listening to hundreds and hundreds of podcasts, thousands of hours, the majority of it is bad news. And these trading cards are fun. And it's a way to still enjoy Bitcoin without having to like think about all of the bad things constantly. Yeah. And if you get the bad, like we throw a little bit of the joke in it. We throw the, the I mean, they're physical memes. And the, the best way that people are learning today is through memes. And memes are usually funny. So being able to add any of that in there, I mean, when series three, it won't be coming out until next year, but that's warriors versus villains. And it's going to be really fun because we're turning all of our uh, Bitcoin warriors into Greek gods. And then we've got some amazing plays on the villains coming up. So it is going to be a lot of fun. And we're going to be able to meme it out a little bit more than we already have. And again, it's just making all of this crap sadness that we're constantly seeing as Bitcoiners, because we're red pilled, we're orange pilled, shit screwed up, but hey, man, we can trade these trading cards and have a lot of fun <laughs> and learn these little topics. And and really, it's like we can work together. We can peer-to-peer transact with these trading cards. We can have these communities and groups that we're chatting in about the cards, making fun of ourselves about how we're like addicted to these things and I can't wait for my next pack. And like, if you're not in the Telegram, I recommend it because it is fun. <laughs> and there's not a whole lot of like bad news things that drop, even if it does pretty quickly, people are changing the subject onto something fun really quickly. And I think that's the collectible. That's the, not just my cards, but Bitcoin panties, Pablo, he's the man. He brought panties to Bitcoin. And (laughs) why is he so successful? Because it's really cool. My wife even loves them. Like there's so many really cool creative things coming out of this and let's, really try to celebrate the things that are fun in Bitcoin as much as we can. Because I can guarantee you, we're not going to get many people from the general public stepping over to where we're at if we don't find a way to make it really fun for them at the same time. That's true. That's a great perspective, man. Um, So I know Bitcoin is permissionless, uh, but using somebody's right uh, name, face and likeness typically isn't. So how are you sourcing the villains for the, the, are, are you like, did you reach out to Elizabeth Warren and say, hey, ma'am, we'd love to put you on the face of one of our Bitcoin trading cards. What do you think of that? 
Uh, you know, I can't say I wouldn't do that because um, I, I've been known to uh, step over the line a little bit on certain things like that. But no, I think there's ways that we can play with it and change the name, cha change some likeness. Um, there's a lot of aliens from a lot of movies that we've seen that are very similar <laughs> to a lot of these villains. <laughs> okay. So we can, we can, yeah, you know, there's without, the artistic, yeah. You know, and and artistic if, she up, I like this. if she steps up and she's like, why did you make me job of the hut? And I'm like, what? I wouldn't, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's really screwed up of you to uh, associate yourself with Jabba the Hutt. This is yeah. like, there, there's things we can do and I don't think wow. they're going to want to claim that that's necessarily them, so. That's hysterical. I love this, man. I, so I absolutely love what you're doing. This is so cool. And uh, like I mentioned before, I think we should jump into some of the joy that you're talking about bringing to the world. I've got this FUD Buster pack uh, I, I bought directly from you. Um, I don't really know what I'm getting into. Um, but I see here, there's only, it says that there's only 21,000 uh, packs, which makes me not even want to open it. It makes me kind of want to hold on to it, uh, and give it down to, you know, my kin later, but, uh, I'm going to do this just for, uh, the TV here. And, and then maybe hopefully you can, um, you know, as I pull these things out, you can let me know if it's special or what's special about it, what you're thinking with the artwork yeah, uh, and everything like yeah. that. So, all right. First first card bitcoin dca dollar cost av uh dollar <laughs> dollar cost average it's not about timing the market it's about time in the market yes so that one honestly came um to get the acronyms in bitcoin is is really important into these cards because i did have a lot of feedback from the general public saying you guys talk in your own language I don't understand. I tried to watch a couple podcasts and there's like all of these different acronyms and all these different words that I don't understand. So it's throwing the flashcards in there for some of the most important acronyms, I think is a really important one. And God, what's more important than dollar cost averaging in Bitcoin? Okay. Uh, awesome. And then what, what are they like? This says like economics at the top. Is that like an identifier of like what part yeah. of the series this is? And so that's a, the, a category. So we have eight different categories and economics is a particular category in the series. Okay. And then on the back here, you have, uh, you have a saying, I'm probably not going to be able to see this, but there's a saying and then also a description of what dollar cost averaging is. And then there's some information at the bottom. Anything important in the bottom uh, as far as collector uh, cl collectability goes? So uh, on, on those, because it's not a foil card, it's just the series two and then the card number that it is in the series. Um, other than that, it's a common card. But being in the, the trading card market for many years, we, there's only around, I think, 2030 two don't quote me exactly but something really rough to that comment of each common card in this series which is actually around the same as a lot of uh, rare cards and a lot of series so even our common cards are more uh, as rare on average as a lot of the rare cards and other series that are put out okay very cool uh one of the best bitcoin speakers there is out there natalie brunel uh, I know that she was uh, at your guys' booth chat and she was pretty, pretty excited to to see her face on a card. Yes, she was signing cards and, and loving it. She's amazing. I just watched your podcast with her, a great podcast. And then on the back there, you could see there's a little signature spot. So what I really like about having the warrior cards is even for myself, uh, going to these conferences and then wanting to walk up and meet a lot of these uh, amazing Bitcoin warriors, it's really hard to walk up and it's kind of awkward, not just for us, but for them. So it's kind of a door opener to walk up and go, hey, Natalie, uh, would you sign my card? And it just makes them lighten up because they're excited about being on a card. And then, oh my God, I, oh, you know, sign my trading card. So I think it's just a really cool way to start uh, bridging the gap between the plebs and the warriors and bringing us together and, and just making it a less awkward um, first time meeting each yeah. other. Yeah, I think that's really important. I mean, for, for me, getting started in the space uh, or getting started doing my podcast and reaching out to these guests, um, I mean, everybody is so friendly in the space and like really the only thing interfering from you having a discussion, right? Like we're all here to build a better world. So like if you're at 
you know, Pacific Bitcoin or Bitcoin 2023, and you see a Bitcoiner that you watch all the time, like they're just normal people trying to make the same change to the world that you are. Like you should have zero hesitation to go up and say hello, or at least that that's my opinion, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like that's how connections are made. Uh, that's how you find opportunity for where you can make a difference. You, you have those conversations with people that have the connections. Uh, and, and so like, I think that that's huge, right? Like if you got a card and that, that bridges your gap of being scared, uh, to go up and say hi, to ask somebody to sign something like, great, do that. And then have that conversation that you want to have. Yeah. That, and, and we're all like in the, the coolest, most amazing transition in human history. We've talked about it a couple of times already. Um, dude, I, I, there's no card I would rather collect more than like a Bitcoin warrior or someone in the Bitcoin space that's making waves because this is world changing. So if there's a, a like a sports, there's there's an athlete or a movie star, or whatever they've done some really cool things. All right, they they broke the home run record and did some sweet shit. That's that's wonderful. Definitely something my kids are into and all that. But it's nowhere near the same as someone that's literally part of the revolution to fix the monetary system and possibly start making this world a better place. I don't think yeah. there's many athletes that have any chance of being able to do what these Bitcoin warriors are working on. Yeah, I, I, I hope, uh, you know, with your connections that you're making in Africa, that perhaps at some point you do an African series of this stuff, because. Uh, yes, we've got a lot in the works for, for all of that. We're, we're hopefully be able to start hitting um, different continents as we go. We're working on a European series right now. And yeah, it's just cool. how much can we do and how quick can we do it? So just making sure that everything is quality over quantity. That's number one. Yeah, awesome. Next card is government can't stop Bitcoin. And you've got like all hell breaking loose in a, in a full battle shown on there. And I can't really see, oh, you got, you got a Bitcoin bubble around a couple people lounging on a beach. <laughs> yes, I love well, it. it's, it's the force field. So that, that's uh, the theme of series two is FUD busters. So that category was created just for um, that series that we're in right now uh, to bust the FUD. And again, it's really meant to go out to the general public, but that's a lot of what we get are those basic uh, questions that come in. Uh, the government can stop it. It's a Ponzi. Um, it's too volatile. So we made cards for each one of those um questions or statements that we get from the general public, our friends and family all the time. Beautiful. I love the quote on here. You don't ban Bitcoin. Bitcoin bans you. Max Kaiser. Wild dude. Yes. <laughs> He's the man. Now you'll have to, I don't know if this is foil or not. And, and is there a foil in every pack? There is a foil in every pack. So I think that this is the foil card. We got a hot on that. Is it sparkling when you turn it? Yeah, it's got oh, a little yeah, sparkle. I see it sparkle. You got to pull it back a little bit so your viewers yeah. can see the sparkle and then give it a little twist. Yeah, there you go. You can see it a little bit. Yep. Hot on that, the space cat, defender of Bitcoin and creator of Citadel 21, a taco pleb and igniter of the lightning torch. <laughs> we are all hot on that. Yeah, we're all hot on that. We all need to be hot on that with uh, all those legal fees he kind of racked up. Uh, yes. <laughs> the last couple of years. Um, ooh, speaking of good good villains for that. Um, okay, yeah, I, I've thought about that, but I might be in the same boat with those legal fees if I don't do that one correctly. Yeah, that's hysterical. <laughs> yeah, like how, how funny is it? Like, I think the same thing. I'm like, I don't even want to talk about him on my show. You know, because like, Lord knows uh, the zero dollars I've made on this show will uh, quickly be eaten up by <laughs> yes <laughs> by legal fees. Yeah, take whatever you want, you know, like I'm, I'm bankrupt. Go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm still going to produce this show. <laughs> um, the next card is, you might have to explain this one to me. Bitcoin, Bitcoin 21 million. So that again, it, so that's a Bitcoin category. And that one just breaks down the fact that there's 21 million Bitcoin. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. So again, it's it's not giving the 
the newbie too much information at once. It's really breaking down each one of these elements of Bitcoin one card at a time so that they can easily digest it because too much all at once and they go running to the hills. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point. And, you know, the artwork is so cool on this stuff and there's no way that somebody opens up these packs and doesn't read it front and back. Like that's that's kind of the beauty uh, of this stuff because it has that intent, you know what I mean? You're not just flipping through looking for your 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 Babe Ruth card or your uh, you know uh, uh, you know your particular baseball card. You're opening it up and and you want to see what uh, what everything has to say there. Yeah, I mean, uh, you this... can see the artwork behind me. Um, what, all of that artwork on those cards is done to the point where you could blow it up on a billboard, basically, and the details in it are are amazing. I went above and beyond when it came to how much work went into every one of those cards just to make sure that when someone got it and started looking into it, it was special enough for them to take the time. All right, this is a challenge to everybody who's watching. Who will be the first person to put one of these cards on a billboard? <laughs> I've seen some, you know, Bitcoin fixes this billboards posted, uh, but it would be cool to see your art, you know, your awesome artwork. Oh, that'd be okay. a dream. All right. We've got a currency card here. The Brenton Woods system. This is a good one. Really? Yeah. Really Brenton Woods agreement. History into it. Yeah. Yes. So the Brenton Woods agreement. Very cool. Um, and the importance of the Brenton Woods agreement to those who might not know if yeah and it. and it's amazing how few people know I'm, I'm in an office complex with a lot of financial advisors that have been financial advisors some of them going on 30 years and i kick these cards out and one of our little um i guess after party thing or whatever they did and these guys knew nothing about the Bretton woods agreement they pulled that card and they were like oh what is this <laughs> did it, uh, it's 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 amazing, right? Like I'm, I'm in the process of, of buying a home and uh, I would say that the guy that I'm uh, working with on the financial side of things is pretty sharp. But, uh, you know, in general, my experience with, uh, you know, some of these professionals, you know, whether it be, um, you know, somebody that's trying to help you find a home, a real estate agent or, or the person trying to finance it, um, you know, they don't. You know, they're very surface level. It feels like from our standpoint of like, yeah, how far they're really digging into their jobs, right? Like they understand, oh, well, interest rates are higher. So, you know, this, this, that, and they give you a, a, a line of stuff, but they don't really understand like what's affecting interest rates, what the underlying risks are, you know, they're, they're just like, okay, well, you know, I want to sell a house or I want to do this or I want to do that. And it's rare you find somebody who has uh, a, an understanding enough to know like how the Bretton Woods agreement is affecting their ability to sell a home in 2023, right? Like, yes. Uh, if you ever asked somebody to do that, they'd be like, dude, I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. A lot of that's yeah. cognitive dissonance because then they'd have to question everything they've ever known. So it's <laughs> a lot more comfortable to just not. <laughs> hey, I, and listen, I, I would say that's absolutely true because listen, there is, I sell elevators for a living and there are times where I lower my price on certain things because I'm just like, you know, I don't, I think that this is the most fair price to give. And, and well, I have a company that's pushing for higher margins, higher this, higher that. Whereas a new sales rep that doesn't know anything about anything, you know, they don't know anything about the market. They don't know anything about getting called out after the fact about, you know, selling something above market pricing uh, and the reputation, you know, the issues that can come with your reputation, like a new rep might just say, yeah, whatever, like I'll sell it for twice the price, you know, it takes us to, with, without question, if they can get away with it, they do it. And um, so that cognitive dissonance is, is you know, it's, it's a good thing and a bad thing. I think understanding it and then understanding that you, that you operate within a world that that is just, built this way now. And as long as you're actively pushing for a better world um, and making that transition, I think that's okay. Right? Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to go through the rest of the cards. That was very cool. Um, thank you for kind of uh, explaining them and your thought process when, uh, when making them. I think it's a, um, you know, a really cool thing that you're doing. I'm excited to see how it continues to develop. Uh, I hope it keeps uh, 
growing at an exponential rate and at one that has you going like, holy shit, how the hell am I going to keep up? Um, uh, so hopefully it opens up time for you and your family in the future where you can really spend a lot of time with each other, you know? Yes, that's that's the ultimate goal. Um, it's all about our time. So everything we're doing is to capture as much of that as possible. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, what's to come with this. We're actually going to, um, uh, it's put on by Comic-Con. It's not the Comic-Con, but there's still going to be 50, 10 to 15,000 people a day um, in California in August. And we're going to do our first attempt to hit the general public with these cards and start seeing what feedback we get on them. Cause again, that's the ultimate purpose. So to give that one a try, I'm, I'm really, really excited to see what happens with this one. Cause hey, throw me in front of that many people that probably know nothing about Bitcoin and all of a sudden Bitcoin trading cards is sitting next to a Pokemon and a, and a Panini booth. It's definitely going to be a, game changer <laughs> yeah man that that'll be so fun i'd love to hear how that goes i mean um i'm trying to think of you know wh what the connection can make other than you know collectibles in general right maybe you maybe you go back the other route right like bitcoiners like the cards because they understand scarcity and it's like collectors understand scarcity so maybe they maybe that's the you know the 21 million path is the way to go on the conversations there just kind of yeah uh, you know, as uh, Missy Elliott says, flip it and reverse it, right? Absolutely. Um, so cool, man. Any anything else? Uh, anything else you want to talk about with the projects? It sounds like you you're just you're just killing it, and you got your hands full with uh, new stuff, and you're really you're doing a lot more with it than I expected when I was setting up this interview. I think uh, you know, I think the the playing cards is going to be huge. You know, the the tarot size cards. That's really cool that you're doing that. Yeah, thank you. Now, we, we I don't think we'd have enough time because we've literally only uh, just barely touched on a lot of the things we're working on. I can say that over the next uh, year, year and a half, um, it's it get ready. And the reason why I can say that is because I'm not corporate. I'm not. I don't have a, a massive background in any of these things. I'm an artist with um, hope, but a drive for my children's future like no other. And I know how fast the world is moving and a pretty scary situation right now. So I'm giving it everything I got. Normally, when it comes to business, you don't rush things. You take your time, and and which I did. I took all, over four years to get to this point, but... I feel like with as fast as things are moving in a, in a downward project slope, um, need to do whatever I can as fast as I can and uh, take the risk and throw the Hail Mary. And I've said that a few times. Um, I'm going to be the Hail Mary where I'm going to throw it as hard as I can, as far as I can, and, and really hope for the home run. And it's not about the success of this company or, or anything that I'm building on right now. It's about Bitcoin adoption and getting out as much information as we can to the general public. And honestly, like Bitcoin is such a huge part of this, but freedom is more important. I We don't need Bitcoin if the world is free and people are free. So it's kind of a balance to me to get that freedom aspect and education out there as much as possible. I think one of the biggest things we're missing and why a lot of people are afraid to come to Bitcoin um, critical thinking has become a thing of the past. And I just hope that with the artwork, with the, the simple descriptions, with making this fun, we can spark some critical thinking out there and get some people to step up a little bit in their brain power and just take that chance because the majority of people are good. The majority of people are smart and, and they have it. They are just too comfortable the cognitive dissonance is holding them down. Their, their comfortability is holding them down. It's right there on the tip of their tongue, on the tip of their mind, and they're ready for it. They just need that spark. And I hope that I can play any part in that. And why I feel so confident that we're going to be able to do this is because we have collaborated with any and every Bitcoiner out there that wants to help us make this happen, put them in the pack, um, go beyond that, like whatever we can do to collaborate. That's the biggest thing that I'll leave this off with is any of us in Bitcoin, we need to all understand this fight is so much bigger than one of us or 10 of us or a hundred of us. This is the biggest fight in human history that we're up against right now. And we have a chance to do it non-violently. 
which is even more incredible. What Satoshi created is pure magic. And when people hear about Satoshi, it's like a fantasy. So adding the trading cards, working on some of these other ideas. So we have a comic book series we're doing with storylines behind this, taking that beautiful magic of Satoshi, the magic of what we're in right now and what we're doing, it's, it's fantasy but it's real and we're in it. We're living it right now. It's the most amazing time in, in history, in my opinion. So just work with anybody you can, reach out to anyone you can, shake hands and make alliances because all of us are in the same alliance. We are all out for the same purpose. And I don't think there's ever been a industry or a category or a cause or anything where it's truly been all out for the same purpose. And yep. that, again, it's more magic. So that's where I get excited, really feel confident that the next couple of years, uh, we get this next having and we start moving forward. Um, we're, we're going after the NFTs, we're going to give them a run for their money and try to uh, get uh, hopefully a bunch of people to understand that uh, JPEGs are cool, but um, get back to the physical. And that's <laughs> not just trading cards, but that's your family. Step outside of the metaverse, embrace your family, go on a walk stare at the stars like hopefully yeah. these are the things that start to trigger in people because the more that happens the more they'll be connected to the earth to each other and we've got a bright orange future in front of us if we can get it done dude so so cool so powerful um you know we're we're all we all work for bitcoin right like at, at the end of the day so like you said you know reach out to the people you need to reach out, offer help when you can offer it. You know, um, I'm, I'm happy to have you on the show whenever you want to come on the show to talk about this stuff. Uh, if there's Thank anything you. I can ever do for you, please let me know. Um, you, you kind of, you kind of just killed it. And I hate to even ask you this, but a question that I ask, uh, this will just be the best podcast ever. If you're just going to like murder on the level of your last little, uh, rant <laughs> there, but, um, I sell elevators. Give me your 30 second elevator pitch for Bitcoin. If, if you, if you had to. So this is the, this is my lead that I go on with just about anybody, because if they don't follow with this in the way of a little bit of that critical thinking sparking, that's probably just not going to happen period. And they love communism, and socialism, and they actually know what it is, which is really scary. Um, Bitcoin is hope. It's not about um, personal monetary gains in the end. It's about freedom. I mean, the same things we were just talking about. And this is our chance at freedom like we've never had before. And if you're not worried, like my dad, he was not worried about the monetary gains. It's not something he was interested in. When he started learning about the freedom that Bitcoin can bring to not just us, but countries that right now need it, a thousand times more than us. We are comfortable, but in Africa, they're not comfortable. In Venezuela, they're, they're not very comfortable. In Argentina and a lot of places around the world. So if you're not jumping into Bitcoin, dollar cost averaging a little bit here and there for your own personal gain, whether it be monetary or for your kids or your future, by learning about Bitcoin, by doing anything in Bitcoin right now and helping the adoption of Bitcoin in any way is helping the freedom of people all over this entire world. And if there was ever a charity that you could ever donate to, this is definitely the charity that people need to start paying attention to because this is the first charity that's decentralized. And there is no one person scamming off the top. Majority of charities, and I lead with this one when I tell the most people that I meet, this is exactly what I say. When you donate to a charity, the majority of those 95% of what you're donating is going into this guy's yacht. And 5% actually goes to the cause you're looking for. But with Bitcoin, you can literally start dollar cost averaging for your own savings, for your children's savings if you're not worried about it for yourself. And at the same time, you're strengthening the chance of freedom for people all over the entire world. And nobody can skim off the top. That's wow. That that's incredible, man. Your 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 passion for for Bitcoin, your understanding of it mixed with your uh you know, creativity uh, and this kind of like world of, of fantasy that you're depicting, uh, that is actually the world that we're living in, uh, I think is just going to bring like tons of people. I mean, it's just a perspective 
uh, a perspective that's needed. And, and you're so right, right? Like so easy to go down the doom and gloom rabbit hole of, you know, the 300 and $50 billion that we just added to the debt ceiling as soon as we raised it, or as soon as we raised the debt ceiling that we added on and the impacts of that on our children and our grandchildren. Um, but, you know, if you can turn somebody's eye with something that is uh, exciting and, and you know, somebody that, that likes to imagine or somebody that likes to, you know, think of a, of a, a better world or whatever it might be, uh, with these cards or with these comic books that you're creating. Uh, God bless you. Uh, and thank you for everything that you're kind of doing for the space. Um, this is something that's, you know, I didn't think it was necessarily needed until I just spoke to you. <laughs> um, but I thought it was awesome, you know. Uh, but it's definitely something that's needed because Bitcoin touches everybody and it's just what is the trigger point for, um, you know, for each individual. So thank, thank you for... Uh, Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for what you do. Um, and, you know, again, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, thank you. Honored to be on your show. I really appreciate it. And it was great meeting you. And you know, everything happens for a reason. So much appreciation. Awesome. Thanks a lot.